Welcome everybody to the DJ USD School Board Candidates Forum sponsored by the Davis Vanguard. I will be your moderator this evening. My name is David Greenwald. I am the director of the Davis Vanguard. And I'd like to start out by thanking Davis Media Access who will be um, videoing this event um, and it will be posted on their site, broadcast on uh, their cable access channel, and as soon as we get the embed code, we will post it on the Davis Vanguard site so that uh, the entire community can watch as uh, they'd like. Um, I'd also like to thank uh, Vanguard board members Tia Will, Bob Fung and Cecilia Escamilla for coming out tonight. Cecilia is going to be keeping our time. Uh, feel free in the back to pick up uh, literature from all of the candidates at your leisure. Um, I think it's all on the back table back there. Um, I'd also like to request uh, that uh, people not applaud even if they like what's said and Certainly do not boo if you don't like what's said. Uh, let, let us keep this uh, civil and remember that uh, people will be watching this uh, in the community. Uh, finally, um, after the regular portion of the questions and answers, which I will explain briefly in a moment, uh, we will have uh, some time for audience questions. So my daughter Jasmine, who is in the yellow dress here, is going to be uh, walking around and handing out note cards. So uh, feel free to fill out a question and return it up to that table. And then after um, the other portion of questions, we will probably have about half an hour to take audience questions. So the way this is gonna work is each of the candidates is going to give a two minute introduction. Uh, they're free to talk about whatever they want during those two minutes. Um, then each candidate will have one question that uh, they will ask the other candidates. Uh, everyone will have two minutes to respond and then the person who asked that question will answer their own question uh, at the end. So um, Jose uh, will, uh, will ask the first question of Susan. It will go around uh, back through Alan and then Jose will answer his own question. In addition to those, uh, each of the candidates has two one minute uh, challenge uh, answers that they can use at any point in time and one 30 second. Uh, so that will make for a much more lively deba debate. Um, after each one of the candidates asks a question, the Vanguard has three questions that will be answered. And again, it will be two minutes. And then each candidate will have um, uh, a chance to close after we do the audience questions. Um, so at this point, uh, we are going to get started and Alan will give his two minute uh, statement. Well, uh, good evening everyone and thank you all for attending tonight's forum and uh, thank you to the Davis Vanguard for um, making uh, such a forum possible as I think this is probably one of the most uh, important endeavors in any election. So thanks everyone for their collective efforts. Um, my name is Alan Fernandez. I'm currently a trustee uh, on the Davis Joint Unified School District Board of Education. And um, I got to that point sort of uh, uh, in, a, in a longer path, I would say. I've been in this community for over 20 years. I came here. Uh, to attend the university, as is often the story you hear around town. I uh, met my wife, who grew up in Davis schools, DPNS, all the way through UC Davis. Um, got married, had children, and decided to raise our family in this community. Uh, we are joiners, we are doers, and uh, we believe deeply in public service. Uh, and indeed, our career paths went in that direction. Uh, I attended law school uh, and worked in private practice. Uh, 
after my schooling and, and immediately immersed myself in the community. Uh, worked uh, as a commissioner on the Business uh, and Economic Development Commission in the city of Davis, became chair. Uh, from there, uh, worked on uh, with dedicated community members to create the California Bicycle Museum, which ultimately led to the U.S. Bicycling Hall of Fame. Uh, in addition, uh, I've also been involved in many other organizations, but as we had children, I, uh, as many of us do, made our singular focus almost exclusively around education in our schools. And that's really what led me to be in, in this spot. Um, I ran uh, in 2012 because I felt diversity of perspective was important in a joint unified district and I have children of, uh, at, at a very uh, young age. Uh, they're in our elementary school system and I felt at the time that um, focus needed to be uh, throughout our entire district from kindergarten through um, 12th grade. Uh, I uh, was ultimately appointed two years ago as a result of a vacancy, uh, and I think I've worked hard in my two years on the board to uh, establish the trust that was uh, in question at that time. Uh, last year, I was president of the school board, and I was proud to lead the new school board into uh, a culture of focusing on the well-being of every child. And um, I'm happy to uh, say that that work continues. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Jose? Make sure you push that button. Yes. <laughs> Good evening. I'm Jose Granda. I have lived in Davis for 36 years. You pull the mic up to your mouth. So. Well, then let's get restarted this. Well, that's not the time. Just restart the time. Um, I have lived in Davis for 36 years. I went to school at UC Berkeley, and then I came to UC Davis to obtain a PhD in mechanical engineering. I have been a professor for 34 years, and my entire life has been dedicated to education and to this community. I raised four children in the Davis schools, and um, I, my concentration on the contribution that I believe I could make to the school district is that is in the area of STEM, science, technology, and engineering, to see that students and teachers are supported towards that end. Each of us has that several extremes, but that one is mine. Um, I also I speak four languages. I speak English, Spanish, French, German. So languages are a priority, and I believe education also should have that priority. I believe in equal opportunity for everybody, and therefore um, the AIM program should be open to every single student, and I'll explain what I mean with that. I also oppose major age. I have paid those parcel taxes all these years, including now. Although three years ago I could have taken um, an exception, I didn't because I want to fight the system from inside the way it should be. And I believe major age is the, if you are prepared to pay $4,960 and um, accept the duplication of the current taxes, then you should vote for it. Otherwise, you should really think about that this measure is totally unreasonable, it's different than the others, and you should vote against major age. I have put a, um, literature on the back, explaining in more detail. Thank you, Jose. Okay. okay, Susan. Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Susan Levenberg. Thank you, David, for um, you and the Green and the uh, Vanguard uh, Board hosting today's forum. It's a nice opportunity for the community members to really get a sense of all of the four candidates. Um, so it's my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, I have served on the Davis School Board since 2007. Um, I am the mother of three. My daughters are um, 18, 20, and 26 now, so they all went through the Davis School System. Um, they are all now, including the last one who graduated last spring, um, graduates of Davis High and attending or graduated from um, world-class higher education institutions, so Davis did very well by their education. 
Um, I work uh, in my day job for an organization known as California Forward. We are a nonprofit bipartisan organization. Um, we were created in order to help the state of California overcome some of the um, dysfunction that was in place in the 2007, 2008, 2009 years. Um, so we have done things like um, citizens redistricting, top two open primary, um, majority budget and term limit reform. Um, I run a couple of projects for California Forward. One is called the California Economic Summit and the other is a, a collaborative of school districts working with um, the California School Boards Association. I am past president of the Davis School Board and also of the Yellow County School Boards Association, also a delegate of the um, California School Boards Association since 2010. Uh, I've been honored to serve on the Davis School Board, helping to leave exciting positive changes in the term that I've been here amid what were challenging times. We did have an economic recession and a period of, um, of unfortunate uh, budget reductions and a time in which the community stepped forward to support the schools by passing a number of parcel taxes to, um, to protect programs. Um, in addition, we've had an opportunity to be working on a strategic plan, um, something that we've put in place over the Thank last you, few Susan. years. Thank you, Susan. Okay, Bob. Bob, make sure you speak into the mic. That would help too. I mean, you guys are had a lot of experience. So just, I want to thank everybody that's worked so hard on my campaign. It's a, a tremendous uh, privilege to be working s with so many dedicated folks. And I think one of the most in enjoyable aspects of the campaign is actually getting out and talking to community members and hearing incredibly diverse opinions about public education, what we should be doing and what we shouldn't be doing. And I'm amazed at the creative ideas that they come up with. And uh, if you just listen, you can learn a lot. Uh, my family, my wife is here. My kids had more important things to do tonight. Uh, school is tomorrow. Um, as most of you know, I ran for school board in 2014. I would encourage anybody that's interested to go back into the Vanguard archives or the Enterprise archives. I wrote a lot of stuff on a lot of different topics, uh, from world languages to housing affordability for teachers to public schools contribution to community economic development. Uh, I am an educator. I've been an educator for almost 30 years in public universities. Not quite as long as Jose, but uh, certainly long enough. I've spent countless hours in the classroom looking at a lot of diverse learning styles, so I really have an appreciation for that. I've served on committees looking at curricular issues and teaching effectiveness. Uh, in the district, I have been on the professional development action team when the LCAP first came out, uh, the parcel tax oversight committee, and the C CTE, Career and Technical Education, STEAM Strategic Advisory Committee. Uh, and I've also worked with Jesse Ortiz in his effort to get universal quality preschool uh, funding, which would put Yolo County at the forefront of counties in, uh, in California. So I will Thank stop you, Bob. there. Okay, so now we are going to go into the round of candidate questions. Jose um, is going to go first. Uh, hopefully he remembered to print off uh, copies. Oh, excellent. Yeah, okay. You want to read the question? Uh, no, you read the question. You read the question and then uh, Susan will go up first and answer it. All right. Just to make sure I don't make mistakes. <laughs> All right, um, one of the measures um, the, from K-12 uh, student success is their preparation and ability to attend college. We hear a lot about Davis schools are very good. Um, the proponents of Measure H imply that such parcel taxes maintain the quality of the schools. So my question is, what is the evidence of the impact of the parcel taxes on the admission to college of students in the Davis district. Do you know what percentage of students graduating from Davis have been accepted to our local university, UCD, or other universities? Okay, Susan. So two minutes, correct? Yes. Okay. 
Um, so uh, thank you for the question, Jose. Um, our graduation rate, I think, is about 96%. Um, a large um, percentage of those students do go to college and university, um, probably around 90%. Um, I would refer you to the district's local control and accountability plan, which is um, the, the state brought in um, the local control funding formula, which changed how school districts are funded, um, required districts to begin to create a plan with community to set budget priorities. That plan is very detailed. It's 167 pages, I believe, this year, which um, is good. That that means it's a lot of detail, um, and it has had a lot of the uh, of community input throughout the year in order to develop those priorities. So um, as we are working on closing the achievement gap, our strategies, our goals are there, our strategies are there, and the progress that we are making towards those goals is there as well. So you'll be able to see the specific graduation rates that um, apply to all of our students. Um, regarding um, your question of is the, um, does the parcel tax, what's the evidence that the parcel tax maintains the quality of schools? Um, I wouldn't necessarily say that parcel taxes mean you have high quality schools. I think high quality schools exist in communities like ours, in university communities, and our community, um, communities like ours is for, are far more willing to step up and to be able to pass a parcel tax in order to provide additional programs for our students. Um, Davis is one of very few districts in the state of California who actually are able to pass a parcel tax. I think most of you know that is a two-thirds threshold, so to need to vote one, a yes for everyone that votes no. Um, measure H, which is on the um, ballot this November, is a $620 measure that continues the programs that are already in place. There are no new programs funded in Measure H. Thank you. I timed that one well. <laughs> yeah, that was good. All right, Bob, you're up. So um, for me, I mean, the parcel tax is, is so critical to uh, quality schools in Davis. Um, if you just go through the list of uh, programs and, and areas where that parcel tax uh, is used, um, for example, librarians, um, funding librarians, funding science teachers, supporting the World Languages Program. We are very fortunate in Davis to have five language options. Uh, they support, the parcel taxes help support counselors. They lower the class size in first through third grade. Um, so I think those all contribute to a quality school system. And I would not want to take the risk of what our schools would be like without that parcel tax. It's 12% of the district's budget. Most of that money goes to positions. So, you know, without that money, we wouldn't have the librarians, we wouldn't have the science education in our elementary schools. And I think particularly the early intervention uh, is a good predictor of success. Uh, I don't know exactly what the percentage is in terms of students that are accepted into UC Davis or where, but they, they go to the top universities throughout the country. Um, so, uh, you know, I think that that's uh, proof that we do have uh, good quality schools. Um, I think the one thing I am concerned about, and I have been told this, that uh, in Davis, the seniors that wind up at Sac State, about 40% have to take remedial courses. So I think that is a fairly high percentage. It looks good compared to Woodland, uh, but it is something that I think uh, probably deserves a little bit more uh, attention as to why that is. Okay, thank you, Bob. Alan, you are up. Thank you. Um, so. What is the evidence of the impact of the parcel tax on the admission to college of students in the Davis district? Well, I mean, I see the evidence on the face of the kids that um, get reading specialists that go walk into the libraries. I see the face, uh, I see the evidence, the face of the librarians in our schools. I think as Bob and Susan articulated, 12% of our budget comes from the parcel tax. Um, I guess I, I really can't answer the question with some level of specificity other than a great deal of evidence is out there and that um, really we owe a debt to our community for continually passing the parcel tax because it has for so, for so many years given us the things uh, for our students to compete to uh, earn a spot in college. As for the second point, which is what is the percentage of students graduating from Davis that have been accepted to local University of UC Davis, 
that's sort of unknowable because I don't know how each uh, uh, individual uh, applicant's uh, results have come back, but we do know that roughly around 10% of our uh, graduating students attend local universities, uh, UC Davis. Um, but again, it, it depends how you phrase this question. Either way, I think that it focuses on university, and one of the things that I'm proud of is that um, really when you come to DJUSD, hopefully the world is open that if you pursue a, a pathway towards a four-year university like UC Davis, you have the ability to go in that direction. I hope that if a child wants to pursue uh, a trade or some other uh, passion of theirs that isn't the university, that they too have that access by attending our schools. So um, I think that it is certainly important to focus on uh, higher learning and sure as heck our community does and I'm proud uh, of what we do in that regard. Thanks, Ellen. Okay, Jose, you get to answer your own question now. Um, I am running on the theme that elect a different candidate. And you may notice that the three candidates did not really answer my question. They made assumptions as to what they might think it is. Um, and I think perhaps Susan came close to when she recognized that parcel taxes are not what maintains the quality of education necessarily is an addition. But that's not what is being told to the public. The public is being told that major age maintains the quality of schools, and I wish those people who are for the major would be a little more honest about that. And I think Bob also, uh, although he didn't answer the question, he, he, he really hit on a problem. Other universities, students that graduated from here, they remedial classes, particularly in math and science, and that's not good. And I can tell you, having gone through a promotion just in the last two years um, of children in the, um, uh, going to college as freshmen, I would say of 100 kids that we know, maybe three or so got into UC Davis. Totally embarrassing. Um, I think also it's mentioned the 12% budget of the district, I think is an embarrassment that the district, although has asked the community for help, hasn't made any single plan to mitigate the need for those parcel taxes. And despite the fact that we passed Proposition 30 and the district receives $10.8 million a year from it, they still want double taxing the community. We step up, including myself. I voted for Proposition 30 because I believe in funding the schools. I am just against abusing the taxpayers, and I believe Major H is a total disaster. They should be very honest about it. I Thank you, Jose. Say, you know. Okay, anyone want to use their one minute or 30 second, Bob? Yeah, I'll just use a 30 second uh, slot here. I, I think it's important to let the people in Davis know that there is the Parcel Tax Oversight Committee. Uh, that's a group of community members that uh, sits down with Bruce Colby on a regular basis. I was part of that for the last two years. And I feel very confident that the parcel tax money is being spent the way it was intended to be spent. And I don't know other communities whether their parcel tax oversight committee is, is a routine thing, uh, but that is in place in Davis. And I think that should assure people in the community that we're doing a good job with that money. Okay, thank you. Anyone else want to use a challenge? Yeah, I do. Okay. Because I, I One believe- minute or 30 seconds. The 30 seconds. Okay. I think Bob is wrong because the, the oversight committee is appointed by the school board. It's not an independent body from the community or a professional, nor they have any authority to whether they, they are able to spend the money in one way or the other. I have read those reports and I have never seen anything that is likely um, would suggest an improvement or something that is not doing well as opposed to the real audits that the district has had. Okay. Thank you. Okay, um, any others before we go on to uh, Susan's question? You are reading. Okay. 
The district has a growing ethic of meeting the needs of each and every student to improve both their academic success and their social emotional well-being. Where have you seen good progress in this regard and where would you encourage more? Bob, you are up. Okay, well I, I, I realize that that is a area of emphasis for the district, uh, certainly dealing with the achievement gap and uh, you know trying to get uh, kids off to a good start. And you know I think there has been progress that has been made. Um, you know I think there's a lot more progress that needs to be done. And I'm a firm believer in investing early. Uh, that's why I was supporting the uh, idea of an increase in sales tax in the county to guarantee a quality preschool uh, for many of our uh, children in the county, but that in also includes Davis. Um, I was looking at the information I did with uh, the school district, and, and there was a disturbing trend in terms of uh, success of some of the English language learners. Um, uh, later on in uh, their education, and it seemed to be a trend that was downward. Uh, and I think that would bear some looking a little bit more closely at to see why that is. Uh, but I think we do need to invest early, and I think uh, some of the programs that encourage reading are excellent. Uh, I think the Bridge program is has a good track record. Um, I would encourage uh, uh, even more investment uh, early on uh, because if kids can read at grade level by third grade that is a predict predictor of long-term success. Uh, I would advocate uh, I'm on the Explore It uh, Science Center uh, board and that is a uh, local institution that has tremendous experience with hands-on inquiry-based learning at the elementary school level and I'd like to see the district partner with Explore It to offer uh, after class uh, science lessons, and I think that would be a, a big help for at risk kids to have that experience. Thanks, Bob. Okay, Alan, you're up. Well, the question in two parts is, you know, where have you seen good progress in emotional in the emotional well-being of our students, and and where would you encourage more? And so, um, for the first part, I would say, uh, as I mentioned previously, I'm proud of uh, the new board, how we have uh, um, established a priority of the well-being of every child. And in that effort, we have looked at things that are sort of outside the box. I say outside the box because we were the first district really to move aggressively towards the later start. And while it might have been sort of controversial for some parts of our community. The evidence was overwhelming that it affects uh, in a positive way uh, the mental well-being of, uh, of children, particularly at the high school age. And so I was proud of our board in that regard and in charging ahead uh, uh, to accomplish that. Also, we added uh, some school nursing and school counseling uh, for uh, children in elementary, and I was proud of that. So I would say those are some things that I was encouraged by. But, you know, I, I really like what Bob was saying with regard to the English learner development later on. I think that's a great point, and I would uh, attach myself to saying that that's something that we ought to be uh, looked at and concerned with, and, and I, would, I would also encourage more look at that, uh, as he indicated. But I would also say that, you know, preschool, too, uh, which is something that was mentioned. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we had a school board meeting in which we had uh, a discussion about preschool as a way of closing the achievement gap, and one of the things I was struck by was that 70 percent, roughly 71 percent of the children in DJUSD attend preschools, our graduation per, uh, percentage is 96 percent. I said, why, won't, why don't we have a goal of establishing our preschool rate to match our graduation rate so that we're ensuring that continuity throughout our entire system? Thank you. Jose? Just as I, <clears throat> I point out things that um, I disagree with, I point out this question is very good to uh, let you know what I agree with. I think one of the greatest things that the school district has done is the Spanish immersion program. I was one of, uh, of the group on the first families on this program, and I have seen it from the very beginning, how it has flourished and progressed, um, including um, mixing language with math and other things that make uh, learning really fun. I think that's one of a greatest accomplishments. I'm glad that the program is still going on. Um, 
I think that the the second part is a you no know, an idea that I would like to put forward to the board is that um, we should bring people who are experts in many fields to be teachers. For example, somebody who goes and studies math or science in, in school cannot come directly go and teach. There's so much red tape about the credentials. And therefore, what I, my suggestion would be to make it a little easier for people who have um, degrees and they're not necessarily went to be teachers, but that they could be um, progressively brought into teaching in such a way that would enhance the quality of the schools, would increase the number of jobs and the quality of teachers. Okay, uh, Susan, you get to answer your own question. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, I, it was good discussion. Uh, just a few things that I would like to highlight that we have done that I think is really good, um, significant progress, particularly over the last couple of years. And I want to echo what Alan said. I've been really proud of our board and its willingness to really focus on um, identifying priorities and then aligning resources there. So we have been investing in Common Core implementation, which provides deeper, richer, and more relevant instruction for our students, as well as professional growth to help our teachers um, uh, better differentiate instruction in their classroom across their classrooms for all students. 63% of our teachers participated in professional learning and differentiated instruction last year and there are more opportunities this year. Um, we've invested in technology to support that differentiated instruction. Um, we are now at one device to almost every three students and we're using Chromebook netbooks. Um, they are fully integrated into classroom instruction and we have Wi-Fi in all of our schools to support that. As Alan said, we've invested in elementary um, counselors and crisis counselors, nurses and mental health interns to uh, support the social emotional well-being of our students. We've introduced restorative practices and trauma-informed care, which is a different way of dealing with um, disciplinary issues and students' sense of connectedness to school than our typical um, disciplinary practices. We've implemented a youth truth survey to be um, asking students how um, they're feeling about their school, whether how they feel about their teacher, whether they feel comfortable and connected to the school environment. And we've worked with the city most recently on the 1,000 mentors for youth to be able to um, bring more mm -hmm. community volunteers into the um, into the, uh, the classroom environment. Um, I am, in terms of continued progress, I am a big advocate of Michael Fullan's work on coherence. Um, his most recent book, The Right Drivers and Actions for Schools, Districts, and Systems. It really is about how the board sets focus and then Thanks. we align resources. Okay, um, now Bob gets to ask the question. And Alan will go first. <laughs> so the uh, question is, uh, UC Davis is an integral part of the Davis community and a world-class public university. Uh, the parents of ma many Davis children are employed by UCD. What have you personally done to help utilize the vast educational resources of UCD for the benefit of the school district? How can the district more effectively partner with UCD to improve school programs and educational opportunities for Davis children? You're up, Alan. Okay. Uh, thank you. No, um, great question. So uh, what have I personally done to help utilize the resources at UC Davis? You know, I mentioned earlier I was on the Business and Economic Development Commission, and part of that work actually uh, uh, resulted in a town gown conference that Gary Sandy uh, did uh, a number of years ago and it really got me uh, invested into the work of something we call community the city the community and the university and so um, I worked with him and, and learned a lot about ways to partner not only with university but our surrounding communities cities counties school districts and I actually wrote uh, an op-ed about 10 years ago uh, to the Davis Enterprise about how we as a community can strengthen our ties with the university. Um, one of the critical and what what I have done personally um, 
is uh, really the work around the Bicycling Hall of Fame. That was a joint project in which we also worked with uh, schools to establish tours of the Bicycling Hall of Fame and, and the California Bicycle Museum to really integrate uh, bicycling, which is so ingrained in our community, and not only just the, the, the uh, other aspects about healthy living, but the engineering and mechanical aspects of bicycling. So, um, but having said that, I think there's a lot more work to do, quite frankly, and I, um, and I know that oftentimes people talk about we are underutilizing our connection to the university, uh, but um, I know that uh, we have over in recent years worked with the School of Education on studies and what have you and I remained a you know a partner in any endeavor that seeks to really leverage all of the resources at the University to bring them here locally thank you Alan Jose um, personal experience with this um, during engineering week, um, a couple of years ago, I cooperated with the students here at UC Davis and with the Engineer College of Engineering to organize the uh, Engineering Merit Badge. Uh, and we used the Boy Scouts, um, which are children in the Davis schools here, to uh, motivate them to be engineers. And at first, um, even on the trip that my son was at, they were a little bit reluctant as to what this would be. We ended up with 54 students from the Davis schools taking that experience. And uh, we used the UCD labs, we used the UCD professors to inspire them. I also came here to help. And so this is what I, what I have done personally in, in the regarding to this question. One thing this, regarding the second question, I, as you can see, I am concerned about the students in, in Davis schools getting into UCD. Quite honestly, I don't see it's happening now. Very few get in, and that's not right. That needs to be fixed. I think if, if, the, um, if the UC Davis and the community is supported by the structure of the city, there has to be a better relationship, and we need to get back to some consideration of the admissions of Davis residents. Right now, they are not treated uh, with any distinction at all, and, and the students in Davis uh, have a very hard time getting in. I am pretty sure that you have friends and parents who feel the same way as I do because they have experienced this. Thank you. Okay, Susan? So um, in my nine years on the school board, um, there have been a number of um, opportunities to interact with UC Davis, and so I um, noted down just a few of them. Um, most recently, through the 1,000 Mentors Challenge that we're working on with the city of Davis, the school board and the, and the city are partnering, um, we've connected into the um, student-led community resource center there, and so they have been um, blasting out the, the volunteer opportunities um, to all of their students to participate. We had a number who have um, stepped up and been working in our, in our classrooms. Um, some work with the Davis Bridge Foundation, the work study tutors that have been participating, I've been involved with and, and helped smooth some of those pathways over the year. Um, I personally involved through my own connections with setting up student internships, um, connections into the future farmers of America, just because I um, have some um, personal friends in the animal science department. Um, worked a couple of years ago on an effort called Healthy Youth, Healthy Yellow, which involved um, Jonathan London's uh, Community um, Center for Regional Change. Uh, and they have a data set called Putting Youth on the Map, which um, shows youth well-being and then opportunities for improvement from around the state. We did a number of public forums um, in association with YCOE, the Yellow County Office of Education, and the Yellow County School Boards Association. Um, and then a number of different opportunities just in things I've been involved with. Um, School of Education has partnered with us in a number of forums through the Yolo County School Boards Association, class size reduction, school financing, um, lots of interesting topics to parent community members. Um, also in my work with Saving California Communities and Yolo 
Brady campaign to prevent gun violence. We have partnered with the university, the Associated Students, um, as well as the administration to both host and encourage participation by university members um, along with community members. Thanks, Susan. Okay, Bob, you get to answer your own question. Okay. So uh, we have a university with 35,000 students. I don't know how many faculty, probably close to 3,000. Um, again, a world-class institution. And there have been a lot of partnerships that have been established, but I think it is a little bit too ad hoc. It's too uh, ephemeral. Uh, and what my goal would be is to make it a more of an institutional goal for the university to interact across the spectrum of programs with our, our school district. So um, when I found out the high school was uh, starting a veterinary science course, I went to the vet school leadership and the vet school is willing to put in some resources to help support that program. But next summer, if everything works out, uh, we would have four paid summer internships for high school students to spend six weeks in the veterinary school uh, paired with a veterinary student doing research. So if you expand that across the university, uh, there should be a tremendous number of opportunities. Uh, summer programs, I, I think it would be wonderful because probably many of us in this room have sent our kids to the summer camps at UC Davis. That costs money. I would like to see some slots allotted to children that can't afford summer camps uh, because that would be a tremendous experience. It would get them on campus uh, and it would prevent the loss of a lot of learning over the summer. Um, I was talking to somebody at the farmer's market on Saturday. The National Science Foundation now requires any grants that go into the, the foundation to have a community outreach component to that grant. And he was telling me that some uh, universities have coordinated across a number of uh, grants uh, to help support the community outreach and make it more strategic to coordinate what that outreach might be. And I thought that was an excellent idea that probably wouldn't cost that much money and probably could bring in a fair amount of money uh, for Thanks, the Bob. Okay, anyone want to use a challenge in this round? Okay, Alan, you are up with the last question of the round. I guess when you said print, I took it literally and printed <laughs> it out for you. Printed it out. <laughs> Remember, we can, we can still write with our hands. Um, well, well, that's okay, because I'll, uh, I'll read it to you as well, and I'll read slowly. Um, what about your professional background prepares you for the work of a trustee? Okay, and Jose, you are up first. For 34 years, every day, I live and practice, and I make my living in education. I have, I have always, uh, since I was a little kid, um, had the, the desire to teach. And that, that has been my life. And so um, in regards to the question, it's pretty obvious that um, reaching the level that I am now in education spanned a long career and dedication to the to the educating the youth and seeing them successful, I have guided my students. I have like four of them doing their PhDs, and um, many students I was able to motivate them from the very beginning, where they say that that wasn't for them to actually guide them and and mentor them, so that they they would go into an engineering career, and this is. I mentioned at the beginning, this is my strength. What I would like to share with the district and participate with the children and the youth of districts is if the voters would allow. We might disagree on some issues, but I think in the, in the concern of who the, we need to care for the students, and I think all of us agree, and I am well prepared to meet that challenge. Okay, Susan? 
Okay, well, I'm on my third career, so um, I've got I've got a little bit to talk about. Um, in my early years, I am I was a professional librarian, and so um, I've always found that very akin to the teaching profession. It is really about how do we bring the community in, make information available, accessible. It's a real service-oriented profession, also very organized, um, good skills for for life um, in general. Uh, and then um, when we first moved to Davis in 1997, um, I had an 18-month-old who I had been working full-time before we moved here, and I decided to take some time off to um, spend with her and then ended up um, getting pregnant with our third daughter. So became for 10 years a stay-at-home mom and a volunteer. So um, working in at Willett Elementary, Emerson Junior High, and Davis High School on things. I was a garden coordinator at Willett for a number of years. I did newsletters at all of the schools, um, websites, parent information. So really spent my time making sure that parents had the information they needed to feel connected and to be able to support their kids. Um, and now uh, since 2011, I have been um, active and, and a full-time employee of California Forward. I came to California Forward through my work on the school board. It was at the time that we were um, having those budget reductions and it was clear that it wasn't just about adequate funding for education, although that is very, very, very important. Um, there were also structural issues that were in play. And so when I decided I was ready to go back into the workforce, I did go to California Forward. Um, we focus on governance and finance issues, really helping governments understand and how they can work better. Um, just two projects that I wanted to talk about briefly there. So I, I staff a collaborative of 15 school districts and two county offices of education with uh, the staff of the California School Boards Association. And the purpose of that is to help those 15 school districts and two county offices of education better implement the local control funding formula and their local control and accountability plans. So bringing in parents for Susan. engagement, et cetera. Okay, Bob, you are up. Okay, well, like Jose, I have been a, a university educator for almost 30 years, and I have taught in just about every learning style there is, every format, uh, from lecture halls to problem-based learning to laboratories. Um, and I think that one of the things that that experience uh, has provided to me is I can relate to teachers in terms of how much work they put in to make it look easy in the classroom. And so I really appreciate all the work outside of the classroom that the teachers do. Uh, I've been involved in looking at curricular change. We went through that at the veterinary school and we're five years, six years into that curricular change and there's still some issues with that. And so I can relate to something like Common Core, how long it may take before we can find out whether it's a successful transition or not. Uh, being a university professor, you know, I think one of the skills you have to learn to be successful is to collaborate. Uh, you can't do anything by yourself. Uh, so you tend to work with teams, which would be very similar to, you know, working with uh, five uh, school board trustees. And I think one of the things that's very important is I think we need a scientist on the school board. I think we need to have somebody that uh, understands um, STEM subjects, understands career and technical education, and somebody that could sort through uh, data to judge whether it's good data or bad data. Not all data is created equal. And I think uh, the critical thinking that looking at what the evidence is and how good that evidence is, I think is a very important attribute that I could bring to the school board. And plus, I've been in enough faculty meetings that have lasted two, three, four hours. So, you know, I, I, I <laughs> yeah, if it doesn't get out at midnight, it's too early. Okay. Alan? Great. Well, thank you all for the answers. I, you know, the reason I asked it is I think it is very important that our board be a diverse board It have really input from all segments of our community from, as I mentioned early on, elementary all the way through. Um, and likewise, I think it's important to have a diverse board. When I asked about the role and the work of a trustee, being a trustee is is multifold. It is, you are though at its core, a local government. And that's what I bring. Uh, that's my background. Uh, I, I'm a lawyer by uh, practice. Uh, I specialize in public law and government law. 80% of our money comes from the state government. 
I've spent the last almost 20 years of my career understanding the state budget process. Um, certainly, we, ha we, are, we have outstanding representation with our current president on the board from a uh, university professor and administrator. And the, the goal you put forward about institutionalizing that connection, I think, is a great one. And I think you know, our current president will help. But I stand with you to partner if, uh, in that endeavor because I do think it's important. But really, um, at the end of the day, uh, what we are is a local government in our community that has to work with our city, county, uh, the university, and others. I'm on the board of the Institute for Local Government. It's a statewide organization that focuses on ethics for local government, but also establishes interconnectedness that uh, is so vital to really tap all resources to be a successful school district local government agency. And I think that that is one of the things I'm able to bring to the board is that expertise in local government law policy, uh, the connectedness to the state government, which is so important to our organization's health uh, in the years ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, that concludes the uh, candidate round. And I have to say, you guys are way too nice to each other, so I have much tougher questions coming up. Um, however, before we get there, um, I'm going to have Jasmine uh, come around and hand out note cards to anyone who wants to ask questions. So if you have questions, raise your hand, and she will deliver the note card to you, hopefully. All right, um, so I have to apologize to the candidates. I've made a big deal out of each of you printing out uh, the questions, and I neglected to do so myself. So that is completely my fault, and I'll, I will, I think these questions will be easy enough to follow, uh, so I'll, I'll just uh, read them real slowly. Um, so we're gonna start uh, with uh, Susan uh, answering the first question, it's going to go around to Jose. Uh, you guys are welcome to use your challenges. Uh, everybody has their one-minute challenges, and uh, half of you have the 30-second challenges. Sorry, just a clarification on process. We're sure. reversing order. No, I'm asking you first because Jose answered the first uh, the Alan's question. Okay, so then so we're just continuing. Well, we're going to keep circling. Okay, I thought yes. we were reversing direction. Sorry for the. Confusion there. We're, All right. We're answering your questions. You're going to answer my questions. All right. First question, and, and I had three of them. Uh, DJUSD is a district with average funding. It is disadvantaged by the LCFF formula due to the affluence of the district. That means that effectively the district receives less money from the state than other districts. How can the district, with those constraints, be able to provide the resources needed to produce excellence in education? You need to read it twice. Should I go ahead? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, well, obviously, um, I do. I, I want to talk just a little bit about what you just said in terms of average funding for the district, because I'm not sure that everybody. Um, kind of understands how the local control funding formula works. So the district receives a base grant for every student. It receives an additional amount of funding for students who are high need students or at risk. So those are English language learners, low socioeconomic, so children in poverty, foster youth or homeless youth. Um, so an additional grant for those students. And then if the district, if a district has more than 50% 55% of um, high need students, we, the, those districts get a concentration grant. Because we have a fewer, a lower percentage of high need students, we don't get those additional funds. We get some supplemental funds for our students who are at risk, around 27, 25, 27%, um, but we do not get a concentration grant. So, but the intention is those additional funds come to provide services for those students who need them. So the base grant should be funding the base program. Unfortunately, the base is underfunded in California. So I think where we need to focus as we're talking on adequate funding for public education is on increasing the base grant, and that's for all districts, not just for our district. And then those um, additional supplemental and concentration funds will go to services for the high-need students. Um, so, um, 
What was the second half of your question? So the basic question was how can the district with those constraints be able to provide the resources needed to produce excellence in education? So the parcel tax is, ex is exceptionally helpful here and I just want to um, say quickly um, math and reading instruction, elementary science, music programs, librarians, counselors, all of those things that are funded through the parcel tax are things that, in, that our district is able to provide um, because the community steps up and funds. So while we may be challenged, um, certainly with the base grant, um, we do have opportunity. Okay, thanks, Susan. Tax. And remember, you can always use another minute after the uh, round goes through. Bob, do you need me to repeat the question or are you good? No, I've, I've got it. Um, you know, unfortunately, we're in a state that uh, doesn't fund public education very well. Uh, I think the last time I looked and other people have mentioned it, we're 41st when we used to be fifth. And uh, what became very clear from talking to district administration during the candidate information night is that Sacramento isn't going to be helping us out. Uh, there's not a lot more new money coming to K through 12 education. So I think this goes back to one of my areas of focus. We, we have to partner. Uh, we have to partner with the university. We have to partner with the city of Davis. Uh, I think an excellent idea would be if those three institutions could come together to fund a professional grant writer. Uh, I think that person would probably pay for themselves fairly quickly, and I think we have to go over, go for bigger grants. Uh, just in the New York Times on Thursday, uh, Brooklyn School and nine others win $10 million grants to rethink education. Um, and I think we should be in that mix. Uh, the characterization is they are using time in very flexible ways. They are ensuring personalized learning using tech and time embedded with rigor. Uh, that's what each of those schools that got that money have in common. Uh, so I really think the pie is not going to get bigger from the taxpayer. I think we have to be creative in terms of going out and finding money from foundations, from private companies to help fund our programs. And, uh, you know, I think it's doable. I, I think there's no reason why with the level of expertise that we have in this community, we can't come up with ways to uh, increase the pie through those mechanisms. And I might also say that I think we do have to sort of look at the way we conduct business and make sure we're doing it as efficiently as possible. Uh, so that we're not wasting any dollar that could be going into the classroom. Okay, Ellen. Can I, what he said and she said? Uh -huh. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> if you'd like. Because no, in all seriousness, that's the answer, people. It's everything. We need to be doing everything we can possibly be doing to increase the resources for the exact reasons they said, which is 80% of our money comes from the state. 12% comes from the parcel tax. The remaining comes from federal funds and other sources. So there you have it. That's the pie. So what do we do? Well, we look at all of those things. We look at grant funding. I 100% agree that we do need to do more about aggressively pursuing grant funding. But I'll tell you what else we need to do. And I think people just write off the fact that, oh, the state funds us by 80%. That's what we're going to get. No, folks. No. The, on the ballot, Prop 51 is a school facilities bond. We can get more money if we do a bond ourselves to enable ourselves to have matching funds. It's about thinking smart and about looking at the rules that the state has set forward to really maximize how we can increase sources outside of just merely our LCFF funding. Perhaps we can do a pilot program that would in, uh, engage the legislature to invest a little bit more in some innovative program that we do. So the answer to the question is all of it. And I think I'm well positioned to really know where those opportunities lie in Sacramento and really um, uh, put position our district in a way that we can really um, access those monies should they be there. Thanks, Alan. Jose, you have the last word. Although the question is railroaded to justify the parcel taxes, I think it's very important to understand the confusion that the community faces with this right now. When um, they talk about basic grant and the funding from the state, all students are funded the same way. So there's no such a thing as a Davis as a disadvantage. You know, if I am on this leadership team, I'm not going to be looking sideways to see where I'm going. And that's exactly what, the, what they're doing here. Because the other districts are funded because they have other needs and they have other kinds of students. They have poor students and they have English learners. Well, that money is going to that. And of course, it's going to have more money. 
Um, but we didn't compare per student. This, the funding is the same from the state. So it is a, actually a mathematical error and a public manipulation, public opinion manipulation to mix both of those. The second thing is I am very pleased that finally somebody agrees with me. In when I, 2014, uh, the, I ran last time, I made exactly the proposal that Bob is saying right now. And I agree with him. I think we should, as a district, go and do professional grant writing and have a department precisely that does just that. Parcel taxes will look like pennies compared to what you can do. And it would not be this unfairness that we have now that only those who have a home here pay the bill for everybody else. When the seniors don't pay, when the people who are temporary in Davis don't pay, and people who don't live here but have a job here also don't pay, but they send their kids to schools here. That's not fair. I think we need to finish this, and I believe we should turn Measure H down and bring perhaps a different measure Thanks, to the Jose. board so that they can fix this. Okay, did anyone want to use their one-minute challenge? Susan. Um, okay. I, I would just caution both Bob and, and Jose. I do remember from the last round of our, um, of our forums when we were both running in 2012, you um, repeatedly recommended grants. Um, grants are an opportunity, but you need to do your homework. Many, many, many of those grants are targeted to high needs districts, and we're not one. We our, our percentage of students of high needs students is much lower than most districts in the state of California, which means we're not competitive for a lot of grants. So that doesn't mean that we are not um, competitive for any grants, but we. Um, definitely need to do your homework on those. Um, I just wanted to refer people to um, districtdollars.org, which is a site that we have been able to create and maintain locally in Davis that shows how the school district receives its funds and then how it spends them. So you can learn um, more if you would like to there. Um, and then I just want to reiterate again that Measure H will um, current will renew measures C and E that we are currently paying. It will fund existing programs, $9.5 million in the school district. Thanks, budget. Susan. I, I okay. Would, I would like to use my minute. Go ahead. Um, Susan, I really have an issue with what you said. You say renew. Renew in English means, although I'm, that's not my first language, means to do it over of what you have. That's not what the, what the district is doing right now. The first thing you did, instead of the $531 that both of those measures produced, you raised it to 620, 17% increase with no justification whatsoever. And then they doubled the time, the time that, the, that the measure lasts, so they doubled the amount. So now you pay, if you vote for measure A, you better pay those $5,000 because that's the result of doubling the tax plus 17% increase. Okay, Susan's gonna use her 30 seconds. I'm using it all up here. <laughs> um, I, I do just wanna say that we are continuing the same programs um, in Measure H that are currently funded by Measure C and E. The difference is that we can no longer assess a multifamily rate, and Jose, you know that because you were involved in the lawsuit that required the district to change the way we structure the tax. So I find it disingenuous that you're raising this as a concern now. Okay, That's any other challenges? Okay, um, so now we are gonna go to the second Vanguard question. Um, again, I will try to read this slowly and clearly. If you have questions, I can uh, repeat it. Uh, the district is changing demographically with more than a quarter of the students now considered Title I and nearly half now children of color. There's been a lot of talk about the achievement gap, but how can the district better ensure that there is equity among resources, particularly across the elementary schools? Bob, you are first on this one. No, I okay, I, I will. I'm gonna read it again. Yes, I, I'm going to read it again. Um, that, that's fair. And again, I apologize for not printing these out. 
The district is changing demographically with more than a quarter of the students now considered Title I and nearly uh, low income, uh, needing uh, lunch assistance. Uh, uh, no, quarter. <laughs> Uh, half are now, nearly half are now children of color. It's like 47% or something like that. Uh, there has been a lot of talk about the achievement gap, but how can the district better ensure that there is equity among resources uh, across, in particular, the elementary schools? Bob's first. Well, that, that's uh, an excellent question. Um, I think that uh, from, look, from outside looking in, I think that uh, certainly the district has pr tried very hard to provide extra resources in uh, areas where there is a high concentration of uh, uh, you know, low-income students and families. Um, you know, I've certainly heard that uh, some issues with regard to the ability of all the elementary schools through the PTA to raise enough money to maybe support some of the programs that uh, the parents would like at a school. Um, you know, I think that that would be an interesting thing to look at to see if there couldn't be some sort of coordination among the PTA to again increase the pie uh, to provide more resources for every elementary school. Uh, I think one of the things that can be a challenge in terms of concentration of students in one particular area, particularly with low income students, is you know, that maybe there's some other programs that they could take advantage of, but there's uh, inadequate transportation. And I don't think really we've examined that in the district in terms of maybe some students would like to go to another program, uh, and it may be a, di a difficult task to, to actually get them there uh, at the times that are appropriate. So that's probably all I have to say. Okay, thanks, Bob. All right, Alan. Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. I, I, um, as some know, I was uh, appointed to the 26-member uh, uh, strategic planning uh, committee uh, in 2014, and it was the charge to really um, revise our mission statement, our values, et cetera. Every year, we look back at the work of that committee and see whether or not the district is on course or not. This year, um, one of the topics that we discussed was equity, that we as a district should strive towards equity. But the work of the committee couldn't really get past, well, what does equity mean? Because that means different things to different people. To me, it means that we are making sure that we're providing all of the resources that are needed for all of our children in our elementary. And I'm proud to say that when I first got on the board, one of the things that I looked at was our district's reliance on soft money to fund permanent positions. When that occurred uh, and the budget crisis uh, struck our district, I think our district, rightly, was trying to take any resources available to it so that we didn't uh, leave any children out. Unfortunately, though, that did result some, uh, in some inequities around our elementary campuses. And so I made it a priority and our board agreed to really eliminate or unwind from that soft money, that one-time money from PTAs to fund staff positions. Because when you do that at one site, it means that other sites are left behind. And so really it's what it takes is a continued focus on our board, which I think we're, we're there now that we are, resources are coming back from the state, to really be vigilant and making sure that every child has all of the same kind of access and opportunities at no matter what school site they're at. And it's been a priority of mine since being on the board, and it's one I'll continue to, to look at uh, moving forward. Okay, Jose. I made a, a proposal last time that I was running and I was opposed to the sale of the Grande property. A proposal that I made was to create a tutoring center precisely to, to cure the achievement gap uh, for any students, whether it's uh, low income or whatever it is. But uh, I am critical of the, of the board. They sold the property and now they, you know, something like that could be very beneficial to our students precisely to have like a tutoring center or or strengthening some after school programs so that they, um, they can combine uh, learning with having some fun. 
And um, but I believe that that's that's where the answer might be because during the day there's the teachers and everybody is is doing the their the regular program, but we need to pay attention to these students that are behind. And my answer would be to promote after school programs um, f uh, with the idea of tutoring or create a tutoring center. If not, the grande property is gone, maybe look for another site, but think it of that way so that to help these students. Okay, Susan. So the Grande property was surplus. It was not needed as a school site. We oh. do provide uh, tutoring opportunities before, during, and after school on all of our school sites. Um, and I hate to sound like a broken record, but I just want to go back to our tool for closing the achievement gap is the local control and accountability plan. It is the place where we are looking at the data. It's the place where we are spending our money. And it's the place where we can see whether we were making any progress. So the local control funding formula was designed to create e equitable education opportunities for all students. And we have been on the, the low side because our high need student population is not as many. It's growing, as you point out. And that local control and accountability plan is our tool um, to be closing the achievement opportunity gap. And then um, I just want to um, say uh, the parcel tax, the investment that this community makes through a parcel tax is an investment not just in our own individual children. We don't put our children in private school in Davis. We put our children in public school and we invest our tax dollars in supporting those kids. So that is just, we are unique, not, we are not the only district who does that, but we are certainly um, rare. And it is the reason that I um, chose to live in Davis, why I choose to stay in Davis, and why I am honored to serve on the school board. This is a community that supports all our kids in all of our schools. Okay, thank you. Um, does anyone want to use their challenge for this one? No? Okay. So here's my last question. Uh, when we are done with that, we're going to take a five-minute break so that I can quickly go over the cards. If uh, you have a question, make sure you've written it down and, and, and gotten it to Jasmine so that uh, we can do this as, uh, as expeditiously as possible. All right. Um, so let's see. It's Alan is first. Um, this is the AIM question. Uh, do you support the current changes to the AIM program? Do you believe the changes have been beneficial to the school district? Why or why not? Well, certainly I support the vote that we all took and, and, and it was a unanimous vote on, on um, revising uh, the, the criteria for the program. But I do, th I mean, there are uh, other, there's a subsequent vote as it related to how then we implement those changes that I, I, I had a different perspective on. Um, I mean, look at the bottom line is public policy is something that isn't uh, you uh, put all of the elements in a magic box and push out comes the uh, answer to solve all problems for all people. I think where the original uh, desire started from was a desire to really do better in our um, education system at reaching every child, so-called differentiated instruction. What are we doing as a community to make sure that we are, in fact, caring about every single child in every classroom seat? And that was really how I always viewed the gist of that first initial motion. Subsequently, it, we learned about uh, the, the best practices and the way certain tests are uh, administered to re result in um, uh, allowing for entrance into a program, and we made some changes. Uh, but I think I've been very vocal in saying that I think this is something that we need to constantly revisit to make sure we're doing our best and to make sure that we are in, truly, in fact, doing what we set out to do as a district, which is make sure that the, uh, every student in our district has the ability to achieve their highest maximum potential. And so um, I support what we did, but that by no means means that I would uh, not want to and indeed change uh, the direction that we took uh, to perfect what we um, are trying to do. 
Okay, thank you, Alan. Bob, or sorry, Jose. All right. Again, I am very different on this because I believe this was a disastrous decision and I believe it needs to be scrapped. I think they're, they're never going to include people, particularly Hispanic students, and I, I, I believe it's a lack of understanding, cultural understanding, and instead of um, embracing the students, they segregated students. I believe that this needs to be changed completely with a new system where everybody would have the opportunity to get in. The parents, my proposal would be that the parents manifest themselves if they want their child to be in this program and that the school establish is progressive classification of students and anybody from any status should have the opportunity to get in. I went to the University of California at Berkeley. Why? Because they gave me the opportunity. And look where I ended up. I, if they, they wouldn't have given me the opportunity, I would not have been able to get into 98 percentile or, or numbers that they put in there. That is totally wrong. I think we need, to, we need to do away completely with the system and open it to everybody and those who are able to stay in the program keep going until they achieve their maximum potential. That's what we need to do. Okay, thank you, Bob. Susan. Uh, thank you. Say. God. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, thank you, Jose. Susan, I don't know why I have Bob on the mind. Um, so certainly I, I support the changes having been involved in the board that implemented the changes. So, um, and it, it harks back to your earlier question on equitable education opportunities. It is, it, it is critically important, I think, for our district to understand the learning needs of every child and to provide an opportunity for them to have um, an academically rigorous, um, well-supported program at, with high expectations for every child in our, in our district. I, I shared this during our discussions at the board on the AIM um, discussion, but I wanna just share it again. Um, Salman Khan, who wrote the book, The One World uh, Schoolhouse Education Reimagined, said to be successful in a competitive and interconnected world, we need every mind we have to solve our common problems regarding relations among peoples and the health of our planet. We need all the talent and all of the imagination that we can find. And we really as a district need to, I feel like, embrace that as our mantra, that everything that we do is to help every child be successful. Um, so uh, all of that said, yes, I support where we are. Um, we're not done. This is a work in progress. And we have, taken, um, we have taken it incrementally, and we have slowed down when we needed to in order to understand the implications of where we are with each step in our decision-making process. We are receiving information. We are constantly evaluating. Um, we are looking forward to response from the Office of Civil Rights to provide some recommendations as to what they might like to see us do in terms of making sure that our program really reflects the diversity of our student population. So um, all that to say I am open to how the changes that we have been making are working for our students and to making sure that as we go forward with each decision point, we're making the best decision that we can for all students. Okay, thank you, Susan. Now to the actual Bob. <laughs> thank you. Well, I, I support a, a fair and effective AIM program, and um, I also support the, the fact that we need to try and meet the, the needs of, of every child the best we can. I think uh, the children that benefit from the AIM program, I think they got lost in the shuffle uh, in terms of what those programs are designed to do for a certain subset of children that learn and think differently. Uh, and I use as a mantra the California Associ Association for the Gifted, they have position papers. And if you read the paper on characteristics of gifted children, it is a unique subset of children uh, that these programs were designed to address their, their learning needs. I think, uh, I think the, prog the, the changes have been too rapid. I think that uh, there should have been more piloting of pro uh, program uh, options. Um, you know, we instituted uh, a lot of new assessment tests, and obviously the tests that were 
used uh, have not been effective at reflecting the diversity of our student population. So there's something that needs to be changed there. I would put a pause on changing it to 98 percentile to see where we are at this point. Now having said uh, that about AIM, I also think we have to have programs that address the needs of high achievers. And I would like the district to actually look at the possibility of an international baccalaureate program, uh, particularly for elementary and junior high students. Uh, and I think that that would be something that could meet the needs of the high achievers. Differentiation, I think, sounds very good, but only 63% of the teachers have taken a course in differentiation so far. It should have been 100, because we're relying on that as a major area of emphasis. Um, and so I think that that is you know, a, a deficiency that we need to correct. And I don't think differentiation, the other thing is that you didn't establish. Thanks. OK. Um, um, you, uh, yeah, you can do a, you have a one minute. So I, I did just want to share with the audience um, my experience in actually seeing differentiated instruction happening in classrooms around the district. This is not um, something that is impossible to do. It's not even all that hard to do. It's a reorientation of how we do things. And so it involves having different learning stations going on in the same classroom, children moving at different levels regarding on where, where they, where their, what their needs are. It involves allowing students to cross grade levels if they are particularly good at math. It, it involves allowing kids to cross schools if where they need to be is at the high school when they're in junior high or if they need to be at the university when they're in high school. It really is tailoring the educational instructional program around each student. And it can be done. It can be done and it is being done in classrooms across Davis. 63% of our teachers participate in pre professional learning. Professional learning is something that goes on every year all the time. You never move everybody into one program and expect them to learn it Thanks, all. Thanks, Susan. At once. Okay. Anyone else uh, want to use their challenge? Yeah, I'll, I'll okay. take a minute here. Uh, is it a minute? Uh, you have a minute, yes. All right. Um, I think if differentiation is shown to work, I mean, I think that's what should go on in every classroom. Uh, I have no problem with that. And um, what, what my concern is, uh, is there was not a focus on what is unique about those students that benefit from an AIM program. It is not just students that can't function in a regular classroom. Right. That's, not, that's not what CAG believes. And so I think we're going to you know, potentially affect a lot of children uh, whose needs are not going to be met. And so, you know, and I think differentiation, the other point I would like to make is that when the school board decided to go that route, which is not necessarily a bad decision, I don't think there was any monitoring put in place to assess the effectiveness. You could say that it's working, and I'm sure in some classrooms it's, it's working well. Uh, but if a third of the teachers have never experienced differentiation as far as a professional development, uh, then how are they doing? Okay, any other challenges? Okay, we're going to take a five-minute break. We are going to come back precisely at 35 after by that clock, and then uh, we will have the audience questions. So, thank you. Hey, do we, do we keep our uh, challenge? So, I want to say a lot of these have been excellent questions. We're only going to have time to do four. However, on the Vanguard, we're going to do weekly uh, questions, and so some of these may come up uh, later on, uh, but I'm going to uh, ask for these questions. Uh, let's see, we left off with, uh, with you first, so Jose uh, will go first on this one. Uh, and these are gonna be uh, one minute questions. Uh-oh, we don't have our timekeeper. Okay, um, I'm going to eyeball it, okay, guys, uh, so that we can get started. All right, the first one is two-way bilingual education is currently illegal in California, yet DJUSD voted to implement such a program. Why and how do you square the conflicting 
Philosophy of Two-Way Bilingual Education and Spanish Immersion. I'm going to read it a, a second time, but it's not my question, so I can't really qu uh, clarify. But there is a two-way bilingual program in, in this school district. Uh, the the uh, question is, two-way bilingual education is currently illegal in California, yet DJUSD voted to implement such a program. Why and how can you square the conflicting philosophy of two-way bilingual and Spanish immersion. So one minute answers on this round. Well, the question suggests the district is doing something illegal, so hopefully, hopefully they fix it. They, um, I understand this very well because of the languages that I learned, and I also because I promoted the Spanish immersion program. What I can tell you is this, Spanish immersion is the best for English speaking kids, <clears throat> bilingual education is not very good for Spanish speaking kids because they need to learn English. And um, while the, in an immersion program, somebody, some student who already knows English learns Spanish, that is perfectly fine. This is the best way to learn a language while you are not immersed in another country. So that's the difference. I, I think that. We need to promote uh, Spanish immersion programs for English-speaking kids, and we need to promote English regular classes or perhaps special classes, but taught in Thank English you. for Spanish kids. Okay, Susan. So I'm not quite sure. Well, first of all, it's not illegal. Um, I understand kind of where the um, question was coming from. I think it, the um, in in early days when the proposition first passed, we had to have a waiver to continue the Spanish immersion program. I do not require we need a waiver anymore. So um, I, I'm confident that what we are doing is completely legal. I also don't know conflicting philosophies between Spanish immersion and dual immersion. Dual immersion has more native Spanish speakers in it, so you have a even mix of native Spanish speakers and na native English speakers, and they learn from each other, and you bring those assets together, and um, that's why we placed that program at Montgomery or, or changed that program. We allowed the Spanish immersion to age out, and then we brought in the dual immersion behind it um, to really provide a program that was targeted for the needs of the Spanish-speaking families there, as well as the English-speaking families. Thank you. Bob? Well, I can't comment on uh, the legality of the program. I assume the school district did its due diligence and would not have done something that was uh, against state law. Um, you know, I, th I think my one comment would be, and, and this applies to a lot of the programs in Davis, that uh, so the two-way bilingual uh, program is relatively new. Um, and I guess I would like to, the, sort of the scientist in me, is say, okay, what, what were the outcomes we wanted? and how do we measure whether we're achieving those outcomes and see if the program is effective or not and then make some sort of decision either to improve the program or to to change the program um, and that's what i would say okay ellen so one of the things in our mission statement it it really calls on us to uh, develop an education system where our children uh, are evolving and increasingly connected in the world uh, and to do that, I think, is uh, an acknowledgement by our district um, that we provide uh, access and all different kinds of learning opportunities, and our immersion programs do that. Um, the legality of uh, you, you know, a blanket statement that it is illegal is uh, really sort of, I think, misleading to the notion that uh, it's something that could not be offered in our public school system. Indeed, it can, uh, and we do, and we have. And I think that we as a community and as a school district should do everything we can to ensure that, you know, we are enabling learning uh, in all ways, including our languages, because not only do we uh, enable, uh, you know, certain members of our... Thank you. Oh, whoops. Okay, um, the time. I'm going to truncate some of these questions just to make them go quicker, especially for one-minute answers. Uh, this is a Measure H question. Too much, too little, or the right amount? Susan, you are up. 
So um, it's the right amount because it continues the programs that are already in place in Davis schools, and we've talked about what those are already, so I won't go through the, um, to, through the list. And um, it brings in 9.5 million in supportive programs that our children are already um, partaking in and, and um, being advantaged by. So um, there was discussion at the board, uh, and Alan and I were both um, advocates for going a little bit higher with the tax to be able to provide some additional programs that we knew would be very valuable to our students. Um, ultimately, the board came down on a decision to, um, to go with a 620 amount that would continue the existing programs. Thank you. Bob? Too much, too little, uh, just right. That's, that's a tough question. Uh, personally, uh, I probably would have agreed with Susan and Alan that uh, perhaps this was undershooting a little bit. Uh, I don't think the, the surveys were necessarily handled quite right because they didn't quite find the sweet spot there where uh, we might have gotten a two-thirds uh, vote in favor of a little bit higher. Um, so I think had I been a, a board member, what I would have liked to have seen was uh, for the current Measure H, this is what we get. For $750, this is what we could do in addition. For $960, this, these are the programs we could have. And I, I didn't see that discussion, uh, and I think that would have helped sell perhaps a little bit higher uh, parcel tax. But it, it is what it is, and we're hoping for the 66%. Thank you. Alan? Um, I agree with both Susan and Bob also uh, that um, I certainly uh, was supportive of a higher amount, but um, is this the right amount? I think for today it is. Um, uh, but I do want to continue the discussion uh, along the lines as Bob suggested and indeed our board said that we need to continually look at uh, the uses of the parcel tax to make sure it aligns with the priorities and mission of our district and what we set out to do. And so. Um, I believe that we as a community really need to uh, really understand how LCFF affects our district. And, and, and in, unless and until we do that, will we be able to be in a position to really bring to the community a question of additional funding, should that be the case? Um, but, uh, you know, the parcel tax is, is so vitally important to our schools. And, um, you know, I just can't uh, accept the notion that we should vote it down because I think it would tear apart uh, much of the good that we have built over the years. Thank you. I suspect we will get a different answer from Jose. <laughs> yeah. Well, you see, everybody is addicted to parcel tax except me. And they also lack math skills here. Because what they have done is duplicate, double the tax. They went for four years to eight years, so they doubled the amount. So when you vote in there, yes, they are voting for 620 times eight, which is 4,960. How is that less or little? How is they even raise the question that is too much, too long for too few? Thank you. Could I, could I do a little challenge on that? Sure. Math problem. Um, you know, Jose, we don't elect to get our parcel tax like you can elect your lottery winnings. We can't have a lump sum payment here. Uh, budgets are an annual basis. And so I think uh, it's really not a doubling of the taxes. What it is, it is an extension of the sunset. And that's, that is true. That is what it is. But it's not a doubling of the taxes. Um, that's certainly a mischaracterization of actually what it is. Should we be able to uh, receive it all in a lump sum like we have that option for the lottery ticket we purchase? Well, then maybe I would, uh, you know, uh, consider your argument in that regard. No, I, I, I need to challenge that. Um, well, this is the difference between an attorney and an engineer. Because <laughs> for them, the world is gray. For us, the world is black and white. He mischaracterized what I said. I'm not saying that everybody has to pay 4,960 in a lump sum. They make it easier. 620 per eight years. There is even a valid argument that is even more misleading. It says 52 or $55 per month. There's somebody else who decides two dollars per day, without, and they leave to the voter to do the math. That's totally dishonest. 
let's say exactly what it is, 4,960, and you have eight years to pay. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> um, we are going to push on here. Um, I am going to paraphrase this next question to be that the district is having trouble attracting new teachers. Uh, do you believe that we should increase teacher pay? And if so, what would you cut uh, to provide that extra money? I believe, Bob, you are up first on this one. Okay. Well, I think it is a, a, a serious problem for the district. I, I think the district is being outcompeted uh, for uh, teachers and uh, we're losing teachers uh, so the retention is an issue and I don't see that uh, necessarily correcting anytime soon given the resources um, so I think that we're going to have to be creative in terms of trying to uh, help teachers out in the classroom and and uh, make their work here in the Davis uh, school district uh, more enjoyable and um, you know, one of the things that always disturbed me, and this is, I don't know how much money is spent out of pocket by teachers, but I know it happens. I think that is not right, and we should come up with a creative way to provide teachers with the supplies that they need. Um, I'm an advocate for trying to maybe come up with some creative ways to make housing more affordable for our teachers, teachers in Davis, and I think uh, other districts other elsewhere have, have come up with some solutions. And that might have been a, a, a good use of some surplus uh, district land uh, that you could maybe build houses uh, for teachers. So I know there's controversy regarding that, but I think those are the, some of the things we can do to try to mitigate the lack of being competitive as far as salary. Okay, thanks, Alan. You're up. So yes, I mean, I, uh, as part of the Strategic Planning Committee, as I mentioned annually, we look and see whether or not we are uh, aligning where we say we want to go with the priorities and policies that we ad adopt. And then in part of that process, we identify what are the most significant challenges. And, uh, and it, there are two things that came out of it. One, I already referenced the desire and uh, to, to define what we mean by equity, but really the overwhelming uh, thing that we all agreed on was our, uh, our biggest challenge, which is our, uh, the long-term uh, ability for our district to uh, recruit and retain our high-quality teachers. And I would support, we are, as Bob mentioned, um, lower than the, the region. And unfortunately, with the LCF, LCFF, uh, it will be very difficult to make up ground in that regard. I do uh, support uh, increases at every possibility, at every chance we can, can do them and afford them for our district. Uh, but in addition, that's not going to be the only thing that solves this problem. We're going to have to think creatively about how to recruit uh, Thank teachers. Thank you. To teacher. Okay, Jose. If I were elected on the board, um, the attitude that I have is to support our teachers. I will do the best to see how they um, to implement their salaries. But salaries are not the only thing. I think we should promote to the teachers the kind of community we have. This is a safe place. And I totally agree with Bob. I think that this grand property could have been used for housing of teachers, uh, precisely to attract teachers here. I, th I don't believe in the so-called surplus. The surplus is uh, something that you don't need and is sort of in the warehouse. That land was not like that. But if, if we could, we should look forward to see if we could if we could actually work with the city, perhaps, in we talk about affordable housing. Well, let's talk about affordable, affordable housing for our teachers. Okay, and Susan. So um, just very quickly, I want to say that the proceeds of the Grande property went directly to building an all-student center on Davis High. So those funds, as soon as they were realized, were reinvested in our students. Um, and we have critical facility needs. Um, I just want to make it clear, um, I don't know that everybody knows, that, the, that we have granted salary increases to our teachers of, for the last three years. Um, so it is a board priority to be able to increase those salaries. We've al also made a number of changes structurally within the salary schedule 
proposal to, to make the district more competitive. There's more we can do there. But um, the piece that I am most excited about is um, the opportunity to lower the cost of our benefits. We have very good benefits in the district, but they're also quite expensive. It's because of the way our plan is structured. Um, so this year, the district has um, brought in the California Education Coalition for Healthcare Reform to be working with our Davis Teachers Association, our Classified Employees Association, and the administration to be looking at our plans and um, figuring out how we can offer um, different options for our employees to be able to access and to improve our benefits for lower costs. Thank you. Okay, uh, last question. We're back to, where are we? Uh, uh, I asked Bob first. Okay, so yeah, <laughs> I knew I was gonna lose track at some point here. Uh, so I'm interpreting uh, this one as a differentiated instruction question, uh, which asks how you can teach a class of English learners with uh, gate or high achieving students without boring the uh, high achieving students. In one minute. Yeah. Um, well, so the question is, how do you teach a class of English learners and high achieving students without boring the high achieving students? Right, and you, you can think of it more as a differentiated instruction. Yeah, okay. More generally. Um, well, I mean, I think it's incumbent upon the teacher. I mean, you know, this is where um, I want to train our teachers and, and get them the best uh, possible professional development instruction to be able to do that. That is critically important, and that is fundamentally what the job of the teacher is to do. Um, I think that there have, I've read a, a number of studies, as we all have, that, you know, when you, uh, you uh, do uh, grouping with different um, abilities and skill levels, that um, there is uh, studies to suggest that you do uh, achieve deeper learning at all levels, and that teaching a subject or helping another person understand a subject actually deepens your own understanding of that concept. So, um, you know, that's, that's the art of it and that's, it, and it is a difficult thing to, uh, to accomplish, but that's why I think it's something though that it's important we strive to work because at the end, that's how we reach Thank all you. children. Okay. Jose. Well, different again. Um, I was there. That means I was in a class when I couldn't understand what the teacher said because I didn't know English. And I don't believe that I bothered the high achieving students because I couldn't talk. So we have to realize that, in fact, while there might be a concern about that, it really the English learning students, unless the teacher is paying more attention to them, then that's a different story. But the, I don't think that that would be an issue. However, it's a incumbent upon the school and the teachers to, uh, to be able to uh, route the students in, in the levels that they are so that everybody is served. But as far as the English uh, learners, they need to be in English classes. Thank you. Susan? Um, so I, it can be done because I have seen it done and just to describe the uh, classroom the the answer to the question is that you provide learning opportunities for every child to access at the point that they're at and so in a classroom instruction that I um, uh, was visiting one day with English language learners in the classroom it was a math instruction there was a whole group conversation about um, number facts then the kids broke into self-directed learning on uh, our practice on um, on different computer stations. They did um, small group with, uh, with the teacher and two interns who were in the classroom, so small group, very specific needs. Um, there was a group of um, high achieving students who were off in a corner working on a project-based learning program, uh, not a program, I mean it was actually, they were sitting around a large piece of paper working through a complicated um, uh, problem together as a group and it had a specific um, real world outcome that they were looking at and then when children had finished what they were doing and they had time thank left. you okay Bob 
So as I said earlier, I mean, I think uh, differentiated instruction is, is a, a very laudable goal, and uh, ideally it would be done in, in every classroom. Um, I think one thing that I'm concerned about is the consistency of the ability of the teachers to differentiate effectively. Uh, and that's where monitoring and coaching and professional development is so critical. Um, I think it was the, the Health Kids Survey, uh, the California, they actually surveyed elementary students, and I was actually amazed at how many elementary students said they weren't challenged. That is a red flag for me. Why do they, at elementary school, they say they're not challenged. So I'd want to look into that. And this is a, an area where technology can help. And, you know, I think we're starting to, you know, make some progress in that area. But as a district, we, we have historically been pretty far behind as far as technology in the classroom. Um, and hopefully we can overcome that and Im keep improving. Thank you. Okay. Um, we're now going to go to two-minute closing comments, starting with Jose. Okay. Um, I hope that I have been able to come across to you that I am not against taxes for education. I am supportive of education and funding and being creative, but I am against abusing the taxpayers. I think we have had 11 tax measures, and this last one is a disaster when they have doubled the taxes and they want to basically uh, be deceptive to the community by telling them one thing is only a continuation of the taxes, a little bit increase when they are doing, the, everybody votes yes, they have to pay it twice. They don't have the opportunity to review it in eight years. Um, I hope that I have also portrayed to you my qualifications um, and my sincere desire to contribute to this district. I think that the, we have the, um, also to create sens sensitivity to the Hispanic students. There's 20% of our students in this district of Hispanic background. There's no 20% representation on the school board. It's about time to bring new ideas, but although I'm one of them, I will be a trustee for everybody because, but I am very sensitive to the cultural needs. I understand how they think, and also I am a big proponent of creating opportunities, equal opportunities for everybody. That's why I believe that the AIM program, the way it is right now, needs to be reformed. I think there could be great things also to motivate uh, our district to, um, to motivate teachers to come here and uh, also looking to using our resources more efficiently. I will be an advocate of physical responsibility and high quality education using my skills in the area of my expertise. Thank you. Susan. So I believe that a healthy society takes care of all of its children and really provides the opportunity for each one, not just to succeed, but to soar in life. I love the phrase in our um, mission statement, ignite a love of learning. That's what we want for all of the children in Davis schools. Um, I am deeply motivated to continue to contribute the knowledge, the relationships, and the experience that I've gained in my nine years on the school board so that our schools continue to excel and and always that we're focused on improving what we do for kids and keeping every single individual child in mind. Um, just to recap some of the things that we mentioned in our um, earlier conversations here tonight, but that would be um, my priority if I, as I continue my service on the school board. Certainly recruiting and retaining high quality teachers, high, high quality educators, all staff is critical. I have an interest in the um, type of, of, of um, workforce development that um, Bob mentioned and I think we have some early conversations underway with the city. Um, I mentioned lowering the cost of health benefits and increasing access for everyone. 
um, improving school climate and working conditions through early stage mediation of conflict. That's something we didn't touch on too much tonight. Um, we've seen significant improvement in our disciplinary practices, and we've done it through restorative practices that we've been able to bring in working with students, and then mediation services that we're now partnering with the Yolo County um, Resource Center to be able to provide those to um, when as conflicts begin to emerge that we can actually um, help resolve them at an earlier level. Investing in facilities to improve school learning environments, we've done that with Grande. We have another surplus property nugget field. Um, I would like to look at how we might do some workforce development. And then finally, always, always, always advocating for, public, for adequate funding for public education. The base is underfunded in California, and as school board members, we have to continue to make that case. Thank you. Bob. So I, I, before I sum everything up, I wish we had talked a little bit more about CTE and STEM and STEAM. I think that would have been an interesting conversation. But uh, so I think it's very important to consider the attributes uh, that each of the candidates can bring to the board. And I believe I possess the following attributes, a willingness to listen and observe, a willingness to learn. I think I'm a lifelong learner. And there's always something I don't have the answer for everything. But I think if you tap into the tremendous creativeness of this community, I think we can solve a lot of problems. Uh, an openness to creative ideas and continuous improvement, a willingness to find common ground, a commitment to transparency in conducting business, a commitment to using the best evidence possible to inform our policy decisions, and a belief that collectively we can solve our problems even with limited resource, resources. I think we need to live up to the mission statement that's on the district school board uh, site, that we need to be a center uh, for educational innovation, a leading center of educational innovation. And right now, I think we can do a much better job. We're doing well in a lot of different areas, but uh, I think there's room for, for growth. Alan, you get the last word. OK. Well, thanks again to everyone for organizing this and thanks for everyone's attendance tonight. Um, I, I would just like to close by saying um, that I am honored to be serving currently on the board and um, I'm proud of the service that I have been a part of in the last two years. Last year as president of the school board, I feel like I have maintained everything to uh, restore some trust and accountability to the board. Uh, I believe that we have uh, increased outreach. Uh, part of the effort we did was to really assign trustee responsibilities at every school site. We started a board office hours. So this is a board uh, that is wanting to learn more, constantly challenge ourselves, and figure out how to best possibly provide the best education we can uh, to our students. Uh, I would agree with Jose. I don't see the world black and white. I do see it gray, purple, green red, yellow, and every other color because that's sort of the reflection that I see when I look at our children. Uh, I'm committed, frankly, to engaging all students, and I have been since I've been serving on the board. Uh, I believe that investing in our teachers is critically important, and it's our biggest challenge that we need to really come to terms with as a community. And I do think that one way we can do that is also looking at our school facilities. I think that it's been a long time since our facilities have have been uh, you know, improved in a great manner in our district, and I really would like to do that moving forward. Um, in the end, what I'm gonna focus on if elected is, is to continue the collaboration, honor varying points of view, that's how we learn. Um, not shy away from the difficult decisions, but in the end, in the end, discern where the commonality exists so that we can ultimately provide the best possible learning environment for our children, thanks. Thank you, Alan. I will now do a 10-minute monologue. Um, <laughs> just kidding. Um, I'd like to thank everybody uh, first who were in attendance. I, I'd also again like to thank Davis Media Access for doing the video, um, which will uh, broadcast this to a broader audience. Um, I'd like to remind you that uh, there is campaign literature in the back if you want to learn more about uh, the candidates. And starting this Friday, the Vanguard will, up until Election Day, have a series of uh, 
additional candidate questions and we may pull from some of these cards. So thank you again, everybody. <laughs>